This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook, and we're at the 2017 United in Compassion Symposium in Melbourne. I'm here talking with Dr. Sue Sisley you got it. from America, and you've got your doing some research, which is actually dear to my heart because I have such honour for our um, men and women who serve um, in any armed force or any service. Yeah. So I'd like to give you a personal thank you for doing that I sort of research. That. But I guess first take us through your history as a medical doctor. How did you first become interested in the application of medical cannabis to help people? Sure. I I just began hearing reports from the veteran community that were um, claiming, you know, some really remarkable medical benefit. To, they said that the symptoms of their PTSD were starting to be very responsive to cannabis, and they were reluctant to share this with me because they knew I was yeah. highly conservative and probably would be very judgmental. But eventually, I, I just couldn't um, ignore them because they were the, the, they were corroborated by all their family members who said, "I got my dad back, I got my husband back." It was just so impressive that um, that. The, this plant was so transformative for them. So uh, eventually, I, I still didn't really buy the idea of cannabis as a medicine, but I felt we owed it to the veterans to at least study it in a rigorous and controlled environment. And so that's how we started embarking on this study. I'd been involved in some you know, legalization campaigns in, around the U.S. because I just believe in this as a social justice issue. I think that the, the harms of criminalizing this plant have been very detrimental to, to society. So we, we also launched a, a charity called Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, and we're trying to encourage people to, to go look at this website and join. our. Uh, the membership is free, and we need the numbers in order to create a, a groundswell of public pressure. But we're, you know, our charity is, is striving to um, to, to end cannabis prohibition internationally. And so we, are, we started our work in the U.S., but now we found physicians all over the world that are now joining forces with us. And so it's been really wonderful to see how this has resonated. And indeed, you, you, you spoke just before about social justice. And one of the things that really tugged at my heart was the amount of the number of war veterans that we lose to suicide. Yeah. But it's turned something different. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, I mean, I, this is interesting because I, I wear this dog tag because the veterans put together this to build public awareness about the epidemic of veteran suicide. And I didn't realize that Australia is grappling with the same thing mm, here, absolutely. that your veterans also are, are, are plagued with the same problem. And, and the treatments are so uh, disappointing. The current treatments don't really work. And you could see from the veterans who are on that panel that they're suffering and they discovered cannabis and they found it life-saving. And I think that's the message to the government is that, you know, if, if you have this number of veterans that are reporting therapeutic benefit, then we owe it to these guys to at least, um, and, and look, we have other countries that have already developed more progressive policies like Israel and Canada that have created a system where military veterans can not only legally access cannabis, but it's fully sponsored by the federal government where they pay for the cost Which is of the cannabis. Turnaround. Yeah, I think that's a, that should be a model for the world. Why is it that, you know, for, and it's not just, you know, the group who's in there it also represents all the first responders, right? So veterans plus firemen, policemen. Yep. And I think that's um, when, when I talked in my uh, lecture about uh, finding unlikely allies. I think that's essential that we identify these other groups of, of folks that may not be out of the closet yet with their usage, but um, may be able to, we might encourage them. We've had in, in the states, we're seeing more and more suicides among the firemen. And firemen have a, an incredibly profound mm. problem with, with untreated PTSD. Mm. And, you know, these guys are, you know, they spend their career going to, you know, traumatic accidents, you know, r really horrific. Physical affront. Yeah, hor you know, horrific yeah. scenes that they can't shake later. They just all those dark thoughts swirling in their head all the time. And so um, if, yeah, if we can engage these other 
communities and bring them together with us, I think will be much more powerful. Um, I, I, it's just tweaked something in my mind and, and about the importance of recognising it's not just armed services, yeah. but it's indeed what you say, the, the first responders. Yeah. Um, I can still remember a, a, an old fiery um, mm -hmm. and his PT, in fact, no, he was an ambulance officer. Ah. And his first responding PTSD was the sign on the windscreen, oh. baby on board. Oh. They didn't find the baby oh. in an MBA. Oh. Um, so it, it was just oh. an, a horrific nightmare. Um, oh. So moving on from that, yeah. one thing that interests me is those members of our first responders forces, mm -hmm. if you like, that, um, that are bound by their uh, legal framework and that is the police force. Yes. So given that these men and women have to go into situations very often where mm -hmm. they may not come out alive, yeah. they do not know what's behind that door, yep. they don't know whether the person is armed or not or has not something pointed at them. Yeah. Um, how do you find the conservatism yeah. of law mm -hmm. is versus the personalised um, feelings around the medical use of an illegal substance yeah. to ease their pain. Yeah, well, I, I think that's what's been um, surprising is that how many, especially retired police officers, mm. are are utilising cannabis um, to, to manage their PTSD and other ailments, um, but but are not able or willing to come out of the shadows and talk about that. I the other thing you know we're seeing this uh, the, you know almost um, how do you say like a, a almost an epidemic of police shootings you know sort of unwarranted yeah. police shootings and a lot of people are are theorizing that these are related to untreated PTSD. There's the the policemen are sort of on a hair trigger. They're they're um, hyper vigilant and they're constantly on guard and, and overly apt to use their gun inappropriately. Mm. Mm. So that's part of the concern is that the police community is unable to, you know, they make so much money off of civil, for, you know, seizing cannabis that um, the chance of changing policy is, is going to be a long road. And I don't know if we'll ever be able to fully engage the police force behind, but, but certainly firemen are... Um, you know, that they're a good target for us and I think we should try to um, bring them into the fold. Yeah. So you're researching the medicinal benefits yeah. of cannabis in, the, in PTSD. Take us through your research. What are the um, hurdles that you've faced and, and what sort of results are you seeing if in a preliminary sort yeah, of way? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say, you know, the, the hurdles are, you know, just a kind of an endless list of regulatory barriers that have prevented the work for many years. But now after seven years, we finally have implemented the trial. We're fully underway. Um, the biggest challenge is probably the fact that we were required to, to uh, force patients to smoke in front of us. So the fact that we were doing a smoking study was already controversial. Um, but the data on smoking is impressive that, um, you know, there is really no evidence that cannabis smoke causes any long-term lung complications. So I think that's a really m misconception among a lot of people that somehow um, smoking may lead to lung cancer. We still don't have any published data to support mm, that idea. Mm. So, and that's why the FDA allowed our study to proceed as, with smoking as the delivery method because yep. they couldn't. Uh, they also couldn't uncover any data that would speak otherwise. So, um, so, but but in fact, you know, there's a lot of folks that are reluctant to host a study where we are, you know, cause, asking people to smoke in front of us and that creates a lot of anxiety among property owners who, so that's part of why the university tossed us out because they didn't like the optics of having veterans smoking gotcha. weed on campus yep. um, and they thought it might harm their federal funding and so, um, so we're, you know, happily independent now and we're functioning um, as a private entity with a private ethics committee overseeing our work but but the good news is that the you know the data will soon be available we have a, a 
cohort, you know, we, so we have a companion study happening in Canada. So they, they, we've given our protocol to our colleagues at ah, Tilray. Repeatability. And yes, and so they're actually, they've taken the same protocol but expanded it slightly, which we welcomed where they're going to, they're looking at um, PTSD of all causes. So they'll include veterans, first responders, rape victims, victims parts, everybody. Yeah. And um, and they also, instead of smoking, they're doing the vaporizer arm of our study. So everybody will be vaping and that. Um, and then we'll see how, uh, you know, we'll eventually, in, in a few years, we'll be able to compare all the data and get it published. We put all the data into the public domain. So that's important, unlike big pharma yeah. that only allows select yep. data to, to be, you know, and I did trials for big pharma for years and I was always really discouraged to see how much data never saw the light of day. Right. If, it, if it didn't make their study drug look favorable, it would never be seen. So, so instead we, we put everything, the good and the bad of cannabis will all be put in and published. So that's something I was going to ask yeah. you about. You know, we all like to think of it as this wonderful thing but um, there was a really good uh, TED talk by a, a doctor who said look you know the, the the effects that I've seen and he doesn't use cannabis but he said the effects I've seen aren't as aren't as good as the 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 hype would make you believe but it's certainly not as bad as the people that would denigrate right. cannabis aren't right. it, would have you believe it it's benefits some and it doesn't benefit others right. have you seen a any any areas that it just simply doesn't work and B yeah. have how has um, the response being or the re receptivity being by those who would otherwise frown on the use of cannabis, yeah. who would not deign to take it recreationally, those right. more conservative people. Right. What's been their acceptance? Well, I would say, I mean, first of all, the, 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 the I mean, certainly there are, it's a drug like anything. There are risks and there are benefits. So there, like any medicine, there are certain patients that will never respond to cannabis, even though there are hundreds of different phenotypes. So there may be, it, it may just be a matter of helping the patient find that specific chemova that really works for them. But, um, and that's why patients go on this odyssey. You know, when they first start treatment, they'll usually you know, it could take them a full year to yeah. experiment with different phenotypes until they find that best fit that okay. really works for them. So that's the, the challenge is trying to persuade lawmakers that marijuana isn't just one topic. It's, it's a yeah. very complex plant with hundreds of different varieties. And it's a matter of, you know, some of the varieties are activating, some are sedating. So it's a matter of patients struggling to find that, that best fit that matches their needs. Um, but in terms of, you know, and side effects, sure, you know, we've seen a number of side effects even in, in the course of our clinical trial. We've seen veterans with um, significant nausea and vomiting. We've seen veterans with paranoia and mild psychosis. Um, and, and others who've just flown through the whole process beautifully without any side effects. So, um, and, and no side effects and only pleasant drug effects, you know. So, so everybody's uh, unique, and I think that's the the main thing that um, for lawmakers to see that um, that that this is uh, how do you say that the, the complexity of the plant is not something to be afraid of. Yeah. It's something to be embraced. Yeah. Unlike you know pharma, where they just devising one molecule to target one receptor in the body. Um, the beauty of this plant is that it can target multiple receptors and and be able to really. Um, create a, a very broad therapeutic effect that can mm. treat a lot of different ailments. And so the uh, uh, receptivity, receptivity of the more conservative people? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you had any? That's, well, <laughs> surprisingly, um, the, the conservatives are starting to come around because uh, especially if they tend to lean libertarian anyway, they, they understand that this plant, it's a natural plant uh, that should be uh, made available to people and it should really be treated more like an herbal supplement. I think a lot of physicians now recognize that it, it's not about rescheduling, it's about de taking cannabis off of the controlled substance list because- Altogether. Of, yeah, because yeah. a lot of physicians recognize that this plant has been unfairly vilified for decades and it's, and it's not, um, it, it really, the, the side effect profile of cannabis is still benign enough that it probably should be treated like an herbal product. Um, so, yeah, in herbal products, we don't, you know, put them on a control. Even, you know, St. John's, what all these other drugs, they're, they're made available through a health food store, and that's probably where, you know, this, 
plant needs to be. But uh, right now, the, the addiction potential of cannabis is so overstated by prohibitionists, and it really probably isn't much more addictive than a cup of coffee. If you look at it, in yeah. the, it's not more addictive than caffeine. And um, so I, I think um, we, we have a long way to go, and hopefully, you know, clinical trials like this will help lawmakers, um, you know, will we'll arm them with the data they need. That's yeah. what we're, they desperately need ac access to objective data and trials like this. We're, we're determined to put cannabis through the entire FDA drug development process. So, wow. so everybody thinks that's a pie in but the sky. But not as a pharmaceutical, as a broad it's spectrum a plant. botanical, yeah. 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 So we're, uh, and we're not that far away. This study is a phase two trial and after phase two, we should be allowed to move to phase three, and if the data from phase three is compelling, then you know, this drug could be on the market with wow. an FDA indication for PTSD. So, so we'll see what happens, but I think that everybody assumes that that's a pie in the sky idea to put cannabis through the whole FDA process, but it's really, we're not that many years away from completing that. I so. really, really, yeah. really applaud your high quality, <laughs> high caliber work to help people. <laughs> and indeed, you. as I said, with that are dear to my heart. So thank you so thank much you from you a personal and professional note, Dr. Sue Sisley. Thank you. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook.